Hello and welcome to episode five of Punts and Bunts, where we talk about the first month of baseball. How you guys doing? Doing all right. How about you guys? Good. good. Doing pretty well. Good, pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Robbie has been on vacation for a bit. That's kind of why we were gone for a little bit. Uh, how's Hawaii? Uh, t- till this last week, weather was a heck of a lot much better than here. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, if you get a chance to go, everybody should go there. A lot to do, hiking, a lot of outdoor stuff. You'll enjoy it if you go. Hell, I'll just go next week. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sean is going next week. Right. No, yeah, for real. I'm going first of June, so right. we're going to have another break. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like, like I said, Ploof, he was on... He was in Hawaii at the same time, and he was still podcasting. the the, oh. conne- the, the connection was terrible, and it was like, <laughs> but uh, they're still doing it. So I guess we'll start with the. Uh, we talked about surprising teams, or either surprising us uh, that they are better than we thought that they'd be, or also worse than they thought that we thought that they would be. Uh, I have the Yankees and maybe it's, I don't know if I was a hater or what it was, but I did not see them as of this recording being 28 and nine. No. Uh, I don't know. How, how about you guys? Well, it's, uh, it's because they have that short porch. Let's, let's get that straight. The only reason they're 28 and nine is because they have a little league ballpark. Let's just be clear and be upfront about why, you know, there's, There's nothing to be said about the fact that the other team plays that same stadium when they're playing them and has the same distance, uh, but it's only an advantage for the Yankees. Let's just make that clear. They would only be winning those games playing at Yankee Stadium. They wouldn't (laughs) be winning those games at 99% of the parks or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, for the Yankees, I mean, I I definitely thought they were going to be a first-place team. I definitely had them high up there. I don't know if I had them at 28-9 at this point with just – as great as they've been with a plus 75 run differential. I don't think I would have ever put that um, into perspective at the beginning of the season. Uh, well, I think they probably will have a point where they taper off like most teams do, but I'm, uh, I'm confident they'll stay in that first place as long as, um, as long as we can keep it going there. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's like what plus they're 19 games over 500. If they play 500 ball, they're in their playoffs for the rest of the year. Like, yeah. Well, and they're sitting at a plus 75 run differential and kind of to Robbie's point, there's, there's something to be said about the sustainability, you know, baseball has a long season, but um, well, there's only what the Dodgers are the only team with a higher run differential. So, you know, not really a surprise there too. That's kind of a team we all kind of picked to do well. I will lead us off with most surprising by doing poorly with uh, my team, the Mariners. Um, I mean, same to be said about, there's a lot of baseball, but uh, they kind of started off looking really good and they've kind of been slumping 17 and 21 fourth in their division. You know, there's a lot of baseball left, but they clearly uh, haven't made the quick turnaround that I was anticipating. Yeah. Robbie Ray. I think part of that is Robbie Ray has not looked like the Cy Young winner. He was, he's uh, um, you know, it's a slow start, not the best starts. And I think that's contributed a little bit to it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, that That's a tough division. I mean, the Angels are just great top to bottom. There's no question about that. They're just a really good team top to bottom. But uh, the Astros, same way. Uh, Texas, I mean, they started off with a really bad start. They turned it around pretty quick to make themselves back in third place within six games. So they've really turned themselves around. Um, and I, I think that they're probably one of my bigger surprises. I thought they were going to be better off the bat. But like I said, they're working their way back up, and it's a very tough division. Yeah, I mean, I thought that they would give uh, what's his name, Kalanick, more time in the show to try to just figure things out by himself. I mean, if there's going to be a time to figure things out, the dude's going to be a big leaguer, you know, ten year plus big leaguer, but he just has to kind of figure his stuff out. I was kind of surprised that they did send end up sending him down, um, but uh, to stay in that same division, a team that surprised me and more a week ago or so, but I mean, there's, they're still right there. The, the angels, they're 24 and 15. They drafted all pitchers last year in every single round of the draft. And there's already been some guys that have 
that have like shot up through the system and they're actually starting to look kind of smart. I don't know what you guys think. Are they for real? Are they going to be able to take the, the Astros? I still had the Astros winning the division and the angels as a wild card team, but um, they're looking pretty good. I, I would agree with your statement there. Uh, I definitely think they're a little better than I anticipated. Um, I mean, like I said, even on paper, take, uh, take the performance out of the, out of the playbook they are still a top tier team top to bottom they have all the pieces to have a team that competes and have a team that competes deep into the playoffs but the problem is as we've seen with the angels despite having the best player of most likely our lifetime in mike trout um they've just never been able to sustain it deep into the season especially going into the postseason yeah it's it's a big health thing, right? We, we gotta they have to keep Otani on the field. They gotta keep Trout on the field. Rendon has had a couple. Uh, I think I think he only played about what like fifty games last year or something like that. Go, going back so, to the thought on the Yankees, I mean that yeah. that could be said about them too. They look at how many games we've missed for Stanton and Judge's careers, right. and they've been tearing it up this year, especially Aaron Judge. Yeah. Um. So it's yeah, health is the biggest part, and that goes for any team. Um, any level, everybody needs to stay healthy. Yeah. Another team that any I had. Teams you get, oh. yeah, yeah. So another team that I, I had <laughs> was Minnesota. Um, and now, I mean, the White Sox are starting. They're, they're, they're inching up. The White Sox had a pretty bad start after the first week or so. Um, and now they're kind of working themselves way like back up. But as of this recording, Minnesota's 22 and 16. It's kind of like the Minnesota team that we all thought was going to be here last year, but uh, they kind of figured some stuff out. And, uh, I mean, you start, start with the acquisitions of Correa and Sanchez, two huge acquisitions on that squad. I mean, and you're, you're talking, you're bringing two of the best shorts off of the game into the AL central in Javier Baez and Carlos Correa. And then you also have, um, TE6, uh, a.k.a. Tim Anderson, because he <laughs> leads the league for in the airs with nine at this point. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough division, especially with that, that position. Um, but, uh, and that kind of goes into the next one that uh, Cleveland and Kansas City are who we thought they were. Um, and Detroit is the shocker at the bottom, as I had them winning that division with uh, me being me. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd hold that at this point, but they are only nine games out and they have started yeah. to turn stuff around a little bit, but who knows? So it's a, uh, like I said, long season, but that's a tough division, uh, especially when you get towards the top with how Minnesota's played and how the White Sox can play. Yeah. I just really thought Detroit was going to be uh, better than they have been. I didn't have them winning the division like Robbie, but um, I definitely thought that they'd be right there in the second or third behind the white Sox, and uh instead they're behind minnesota so and i think they were expecting a little bit of a stronger start by torkelson as he came up and right. it, he just hasn't quite panned out yet he's still young i mean he'll he's got great mechanics he's got a great swing i think he's going to be big but it's just going to take him some time to get used to the big leagues and i mean that's not a great hitters park in comerica right. it's very very deep um it's just it's more of a pitcher's park so he's going to have to uh learn how to hit the ball there um right. but and i guess one real big bright side for them for them and their signing of javier bias is javi's defense has not changed he's still a uh one hell of a defender there yeah. at uh, the uh shortstop position yeah it it hurt hurts to see like you know the highlights you see the mlb highlights and it's like javi still is just a different uniform <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's like the same stuff and then you see rizzo in new york doing doing it schwarber um, in philly schwarber i feel like he's hitting barely over 200 maybe 218 he, he, he started he started off strong and then he, he's tapered yeah. back to his normal schwarber self yeah. um but then there's chris bryant who's not done great either in colorado surprising right. with the you know that being a hitter's park um but i i think you know he's always struggled with like these little nitty-gritty injuries here and there throughout his career and yeah. he's in the midst of one right now so uh i think he'll be able to figure it out i think it's you know figure out that change of scenery and um i think he'll be the chris bryant we all know and love and forever miss <laughs> yeah uh under, another underachieving team as of this recording, 17 and 21 for the Braves. 
I'm pretty sure I still had them winning the division. I think uh, Robbie had the Phillies, right? Robbie had the Phillies, and then Sean had the Mets. I had the Phillies as well. Oh, Phillies as well. Phillies as well. Yeah. Mets, Um, uh, they could put them on the other surprising part of that uh, that as well. I was not expecting them to be 24 and 14. Mm -hmm. Um, Just, yeah, unreal. Um, New York. DeGrom, right? They're still waiting for him to come back. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that that's that's one of those things they're 24 and 14 without arguably their best player yet to be healthy. So that's going to have to bode well for them. You know, if they start to hit like a slump somewhere or keep a surge going, bringing that arm in. Yep. And I mean, you're talking, they've also, you know, you remember a couple of years ago, they had one of the most dominant rotations on paper in baseball and that's all broken up. Now you got Matt Harvey, who's now serving his 60 game suspension for the joint drug agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got, uh, Syndergaard, who's just having a real tough time with LA, despite how uh, how well they've played. Um, right. he, he's yeah, especially his last start after his comments about the no hitter, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's that's it. the Mets are of a great ball club, top to bottom. Um, yeah. Lindor's really really turning it up out there. Right. Yeah. Which was it's pretty crazy how almost that exact same team minus Scherzer and a couple other guys were like below 500 last year. So, but, but then you look at the rosters like, yeah, this roster should be that good. Uh, Not sure what happened last year. Um, Another team that I had not where they are currently is Boston 15 and 22 again as of this recording so is the Cora effect gone like is whoa, what's going on so boston for me it's a, it's a tricky subject and that's because just that al east division is so strong they play so many games against the yankees rays and blue jays and orioles um <laughs> that it's just it's grueling and you're likely now i can't say likely because the alos is really good too but you're definitely going to see multiple teams come out of the AL East in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and, the, and you'll see the same with AL West and uh, AL Central is just going to have their division champion. Um, most likely. I mean, I can't say that for a fact, but it's, uh, yeah, the Boston, I, I see what you're saying, but at the same time, they're still uh, quite a bit back. They are 13 games back, but they're, it's a tough division. If they could bounce back, they could turn around. The other guys could have a start, a slow start here, and then they could flip right back around. So, all right. it's a long, long season. Did we miss anyone? Uh, uh, those those were kind of all mine. So for me, I I kind of had the uh, I had the Reds originally at how you know we knew they were going to be a four or five in the division without a doubt. Uh, understand they have turned it around and won their won six of their last ten games. But they started out with a real, real rough time. One of the worst we've ever seen, where they were actually on pace to lose 140 games. Um, so I think that how bad that they started out was a kind of a shock to me because I wasn't expecting it to be that bad. Uh, Pirates, Cubs, Cardinals, Brewers, kind of all where we expected. We expected the Cubs to be about this this 500-ish. I mean, they're granted right. they're 15 and 20, but about this 500-ish. Um, and I mean, but their, their farm system's looking great. So yeah. yeah, love to see that brought up a couple kids yesterday who made the most of their major league debuts. So right. it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you, Sean, any surprises for you? No, other than you guys kind of hit them all, uh, Cincinnati losing, uh, while pitching a no hitter was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's only this what sixth time in major league history that has happened. When was the last one, though? I'd be curious to see, like, if it was in the modern era of baseball or... It definitely was. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning toward it was the century. Um, let me get that information for you here. But that kind of brings us into our next topic, um, right. talking about uh, no, the combined no-hitter versus a, a traditional no-hitter um, and the validity of a combined no-hitter kind of coming off of... Uh, Noah Syndergaard's comments um, where he was uh, saying that the the Mets no-hitter was not a real no-hitter following Reed's no-hitter with the Angels. Right. Um, so that's kind of where we uh, have uh, gone into this topic from here. So I guess uh, 
what are your guys' thoughts on the combined no hitter versus the traditional no hitter? Does it have the same validity? Um, I guess uh, Mike's yours. Well, so I guess I'll go. As far as a com- combined no hitter, it, it was more just like a cool thing that would happen in my head until it happened with the Cubs. And maybe that's just me being a Cubs fan, but I was like, oh crap, the Cubs just threw a combined no hitter. And that just made it kind of cool for me. Now, maybe in my head, I, I feel like maybe it's not at the same level as a regular no hitter. Just, I don't know. It's not one guy doing it. Now it might even be harder. I don't know. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn. You, you need to have multiple guys that are on instead of like the one guy that gets in the groove and then does it for the, for the nine innings or so I guess I I don't want to take anything away from the combined no hitter, even though like, I guess in my head, I, I don't perceive it at the same level as just the regular no hitter. Sean, what about you? Uh, and before I guess before you before you go here, I'll let you know that that last uh, no hitter and a losing effort was the uh, the Angels in two thousand eight, uh, and they lost one nothing to the Dodgers. So wow, a little more recent than I would have expecting. Yeah. Prior to that, uh, it was ninety two. So okay, so for like the combined versus an individual no hitter, I mean both are impressive. Um, I think it just comes down to how you look at it. One's a team effort. You know, one takes three or four guys to do the other is more of the individual effort. It's the, wow, he threw a no hitter versus the, wow, they threw a no hitter. Um, I don't know. I would say it's harder or not. Um, I mean, I don't obviously kind of like Jose, I don't know if I'm stepping out of turn here and saying, cause I'm not a professional player pitcher or hitter, but I would say I could see both arguments of which is hard because the, the single pitcher, no hitter, he does get in a groove. He's finding his motion, but also those batters are seeing him pitch four times you know there's and through that he's also throwing how many pitches so by the time you're seeing him that third and fourth time his pitch counts getting up there you've seen kind of all he's done you know it's just whether or not you're gonna pick the right pitch but you know you've seen what he's throwing where with the combined you're getting a fresh arm every couple innings guys maybe throwing a little bit different stuff keeping on your toes you can't really sit on stuff I would guess as much with a combined because you don't necessarily know that other guy's going to be trying to throw you don't know i mean sure with the scouting reports they know what they throw um but i think deciphering it's probably would be a little harder with the combined only because you know if you're that third guy in the rotation coming up pitching the combined no hitter you may go okay well the first two guys were leaning heavy on fastballs i'm gonna lean heavy with the breaking ball or vice versa is where i think that can kind of throw off the batters or maybe kind of play against their favor in that um but also at the same time with a combined no hitter just takes one of those guys who's not in a groove, maybe throwing a meatball or making a mistake somewhere. And then it blows the whole thing up because there's three different guys you're relying on doing it. And when you're, you know, typically when it's a no hitter with a single person, like I said, he's in a groove, he's doing well. You know, when you're doing combined guys, one of those guys may not be the best reliever in your bullpen. That's why he's just kind of pitching a couple of innings in this combined game. He might not have the stuff to really keep it going. So I, I really don't know what I would say was harder. I, I could see the argument for either or. So I hear a lot of people make their comments on, well, if it's a combined no hitter, it's a team effort. Well, the other is an individual effort. That's very incorrect. Um, sure, you have a your combined pitching effort, but you have to look into the uh, the standpoint of, I mean, if the guy gets ten strikeouts, there's seventeen other outs that need to be made on the field, and almost at least at least once in every no hitter, there's that one play that's just this should be a hit. It should be a home run, but it's just a amazing defensive play takes it away. So it's always a team effort. Um, but I agree with Sean on his point that, you know, when you're seeing that batter for the third time in the game, or sorry, you seen the pitcher for the third time in the game, uh, you know what you're expecting. You come in in the ninth inning. And for example, last year's no hitter in September with uh, Milwaukee. Uh, you've seen Corbin Burns for eight innings. And then you come in to see Josh Hader in the ninth. I mean, you're seeing a fresh arm and you're seeing Josh Hader. <laughs> right. So um, it's just, it, it, it's really six and one half a dozen the other. Um, but I, I don't, I don't want to take away the no hitter aspect from the combined no hitter, but I definitely think a individual no hitter probably deserves more recognition to that pitcher 
because he was out there for nine innings. He did throw a hundred plus pitches. He, he did do his job to force the ground outs to get his 10 plus strikeouts. So I, that was more of my point when I said like, that's the individual, like accomplishment. I didn't mean like the team oh, didn't yeah. participate, but like oh. that guy had to do it. Like it was the guy, you know, cause one is more of a team effort because not only does the defense have to make all those the additional outs, pitchers. but you have multiple pitchers where the other one, I mean, it is being driven by one guy. Ultimately, he's got to throw the pitch to induce the ground ball, induce the fly out or get a strikeout. Yes. It's still the team coming together around him, but I feel like in a single pitcher, no hitter, the, the rest of the team and the defense plays a little more of a supporting cast to the pitcher where when it's a combined, everybody has a little more of a, you know, equal responsibility in getting the team to that no hitter, you know, because there's multiple pitchers, all the players are contributing. It's, you know, I do feel like it's a more of a group effort with the combined than it is with a single pitcher, because at the end of the day, like you said, that single pitchers, he's throwing nine innings, he's throwing a hundred and some odd pitches. He's having to put at batters out the third and fourth time they're seeing him, um, you know, in, in just respect to that pitcher, I, I want to make sure that they get a little recognition in that situation. You know, like I said, 17 out of the 27 outs, if they get 10 strikeouts are done by the defense, but still he had to get those 10 strikeouts and induce the other 17 outs. Absolutely. And I'm not taking that away. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's it, in the end, it's still a great feat regardless. I mean, I, I do agree with you that I think that the individual no hitter, that pitcher does deserve a little bit more of individual recognition. So, um, and just looking over some notes here, it's uh, uh, Detmers. It was his, the 316th no hitter in major league history. Uh, second one this year. The first one was the Mets no hitter, which they had uh, five pitchers throw that game. Um, prior to that, we had last year, we had a nine no hitters last year. Two of them were combined no hitters. But prior to last year, there'd only been 10 combined no hitters in uh, Major League history. Um, So most of them have come in recent year. And that kind of leads me to this next point on pitchers not going as deep into ballgames. I don't like the concept of the opener. I like when seeing a pitcher go usually at least five to six innings um, to get that, you know, to get that qualification for a win. Um, But the game's changing. Right. Well, do you think. Part of that is this season, though, with the with the lockout and the shortened, you know, you know, offseason, you know, they've got you think some of those pitching performances will go deeper as the season goes on, as those guys get a little more conditioned to the game. You know, how much of the shortened offseason and, you know, kind of that, you know, spring training stuff being cut down and just all around a smaller time to get ramped up, you think that's kind of played into the. Uh, less frequency that we're seeing pitchers go deep into games. Like, do you think that's going to continue or do you think we're going to see pitchers go deeper as the season goes? So I think that you're right that to a degree, we're seeing a little bit more of it. Um, But if you go back to 2018, 2019, the Rays were doing this in 2019. They were putting pitchers in for one or two innings to start the game. And then they'd bring someone in for three, four or five, six and then have someone come in for seven, eight, and then put a closer in at nine. So they were coming in expecting to use four pitchers, if not more. When most games for the last, you know, 20 years, people have been saying, okay, we're, we're expecting to use two to three. Um, if not even before that, one. I mean, <laughs> right. you, you'll never see a, a pitcher throw as many complete games as they, as they once did. It's just, yeah. it's, you, it's never going to happen. It's very rare you even see it at all anymore. Right. And for those that don't know, uh, like if casual fans that might not know that this is even happening, there's been a select amount of teams that have started a game with basically a reliever for like maybe a one time through the order. And that's what happened when I went to the Angels Sox game. They had a dude go in. He girt or something. He likes like sidearm thrower guy. He faced everybody like just over one time and then they pulled them for somebody else. And I guess the idea of that is you don't let the lineup get comfortable while hopefully the other lineup, your lineup does get comfortable and is like on their second time seeing the opposing pitcher while the other team has to then reset again on the new pitcher, basically. So. um, Yeah. And, and I, I see that point. I see that strategy to the game. Right. Um, but I just, I, I much prefer the, you know, getting your starter in. Cause I mean, you, you, if you were like me, uh, when, 
you watch games and you look at the, the schedule, you would pick games to go to based on who's pitching, or you'd pick right. pick what you're going to do based on, like if you're going to go to a bar to watch a game or sit at home and watch it or just listen on the radio. It all depended on who was pitching that day. Um, I remember I went to a Cub game in 2005 where my T-shirt that I was going to wear to that game mattered based on who was um, who was pitching for the Cubs. So it was either going to be a Corey Patterson or a Mark Pryor T-shirt. Ended up being the Mark Pryor T-shirt as he started that game. Um, but I've picked my seats in Wrigley in the bleachers depending on the pitcher. You know, if you've got a lefty or a righty, you're kind of going to decide if you want to sit in left field or right field, kind of in the in the hopes of getting a home run. I've, I've a few times I've sat in the bleachers. I've made that decision based on what the starting uh, pitchers look like. Oh yeah. When, when I went to Dodger stadium a few years back, I definitely picked my seats based on, cause we, we only had one day to go to the game when we were out there and uh, happened to be Sergio versus Bueller. Um, and I definitely picked seats that were high up where you could see right down on top of, uh, of the pitcher to get a good glimpse of their motion. Um, definitely made my decision that, that day. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I mean, I just I just like seeing the the starting pitcher. I think it's a it, it makes the game a little more exciting to see your ace come on the mound. Even in the dark years of the Cubs, when we saw Carlos Zambrano come out, we're like, okay, we have a chance at winning today. Um, <laughs> and and same can be said for Seattle when they had Felix Hernandez coming out there. Like it's like, okay, we got this. Let's go. <laughs> so when you get an opener out there, I mean, what what with the Cubs back then have started with Carlos Marmol. I mean. <laughs> Do you think part of the decline has to do with some of these mega contracts in the last few years to pitchers? Like it's a matter of not wanting to risk injury or risk kind of burning the tread off of your, you know, nine figure pitcher. Do you think that's played a little bit into the the shift in strategy overall? I'd say so, but I mean, it really also depends on the pitcher. I mean, someone who's a hard head and wants to pitch the game, wants to go six, seven innings is going to go six or seven innings. Right. Um, and you're, you're, that's when you see, you know, the coach come out to the mound asking for the ball and he's like, he's like, no, fuck you. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely part of it. I think, I think the players are know that if they get hurt, they may not get as much money. They may not be able to get a good resigning if they're on their contract year. Um, so they just want to, they want to conserve and the teams right. want to conserve because the players are their product. And if they don't put the product on the field, people don't come and people don't come. Players don't get paid. Right. So, so like, I remember like, uh, I think maybe it started maybe in 16, I think definitely in 17 with the Cubs when it was like, because they had made a couple deep postseason runs, they were really kind of making sure that their guys were going to be able to get to the next postseason, like without having used all their bullets come the end of August. Like, uh, so I, th- I think that also kind of had something to do with it, especially with those teams that are that they know that they're going to make the postseason early ish. If it already looks like by the end of August that they're going to make the postseason, they're going to start pulling their dudes a little bit early, save them for October. But like we've seen we we how many times have we see Kershaw get blown up in October? I mean, we saw <laughs> the Cubs got to Scherzer in 17 like. Uh, you you see it happen. These guys that are horses all year, and then it kind of, and then I, it might not just, it might not be because of pitch count. It could just be due to something else, just a bad game. But you you see it happen, and it's hard not to be like, well, maybe if we just rested them just a little bit more, this wouldn't have happened. So it's just kind of like one of those things. Yep. And also with increases in technology, uh, these right. batters, they can go and observe every game these pitchers have ever thrown in their professional career. Um, Cause all their minor league games are recorded all or most of their minor league games, I should say. And the major league games are all somewhere they can pull up an iPad and take a look. Um, so I think that's part of it. I mean, just go back to the, like you said, in 20, uh, 2016, uh, go to the world series. I mean, they got smoked by Kluber in games in the first two games he pitched. And then exactly. he came and pitched game seven and the Cubs had his number. Right. Um, so it's just, uh, it, it, like you said, it's really, uh, it, it, it could be that it could definitely be a stamina issue. Yeah. So. I feel like I was going to say something when reality, when reality, the VR pedestrians like us could get that and like put in Scherzer and we could watch Scherzer pitch us like, 
fastballs in VR. Like, Mm -hmm. like it's, it's one of those things where it's like, there's such an edge. Um, There can be at least such an edge with some of the batters. And like Robbie said, like, not only can you pull it up, you can, you can face Scherzer in your basement as many times as you want, you know, and like really get a good look at all the different pitches and where you want them. And it's pretty crazy now. Yeah. So and it's just, I mean, you're not even seeing catchers put down signs as much anymore. I mean, they got the, uh, I can't remember the exact name for it, but they got the, uh, the, the microphone in the cap and it'll keypad on the wrist. Yeah. Yep. Makes it all, makes it all easier. Pitchcom. Pitchcom. Thank you. That's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, And that's, that's cool. I mean, it's, it's definitely cool, but I don't know. Kind of takes away from that that classic style of game. It's like the whole idea of robo umps. It's like I kind of like that human element, but the umps have been especially terrible this year. So like, I just don't get it. Like there was the play was it yesterday where was it Pete Alonso who fouled it off himself and they said it didn't hit him, but it clearly bounced off his thigh. Right. Like, it wasn't Pete Alonso, you know? but I saw that play because it was okay. a lefty. Yeah, is Alonso a lefty oh. or a righty? He's a righty. He's a righty, isn't he? Right. Yeah, this guy. But yeah, it fouled right off his thigh, and they they ruled it a, a base hit. Yeah, and I guess that brings us to uh, maybe just one more quick thing. Do you guys think that all umpires need to umpire each base during a series? Like you know, it's like you know that this guy's terrible at calling balls and strikes, yet they he needs to have a game there, like. So every five games or whatever it is. I think I saw something that like Angel Hernandez is especially good at umping third base. Something, yeah. And so like, why not keep him at third base if he's doing remotely decent at that <laughs> when he is probably one of the most inconsistent umpire. No, probably the most consistent, uh, inconsistent umpire behind the plate. Right. Consistently and, inconsistent. There you go. <laughs> and uh, he, I mean, frankly, he made, uh, he's, he had so many calls overturned at first base one one playoff game. Like, right. like you just can't do that. I mean, right. I, I I like the idea of not necessarily robot umps, but like some sort of technology um, behind the plate. Like if the umpires were wearing some sort of glasses that would show them the strike zone, and they could still make that human element type call based on what they see where the pitch lands on that. Kind of like a pitch tracks you see on the PC, right. where you got the square, and if the ball goes like on the, if it's like a borderline pitch. Then the umpire can use his best discretion if he wants to call that a ball or a strike. That'd be super sick to have like the glasses that show you the strike zone. It's just programmed in per batter. You just get measured in spring training or something like, uh, and it just automatically shows up. That'd be pretty crazy. Yep. That would be cool. But I, I think to answer your question, I think if you're really trying to get the best product out there of an umpire, you're trying to get the best performance and honestly, the best umpire is an umpire you never see, you know, I mean, obviously the, the umpire calling calling balls and strikes, but it's kind of like NFL officials, the best NFL officials are the ones you don't see throwing bad flags or making bad calls or missing ones. You know, the best umpires are the ones that are just, they're, they're a part of the field, like the base, you know, they're, they're not a, human element you know and i understand they are people so there are mistakes we made but if you're trying to get the best and the most accurate you know calls play them where they play best you know station them where they call the best you know the the guys with the tightest strike zone who call you know i i follow on twitter a page that just shows a scorecard for umpires each game so there is a way to measure efficiency and accuracy and overall consistency keep those guys where they do well maybe spring training use that as the time to shuffle guys around, you know, where they're not going to cost somebody a game that matters because they're blowing calls behind the plate that maybe use that as their kind of uh, preseason to get themselves figured out who's going to be best where, or, you know, maybe this guy's got kind of a loose zone, let them call all spring training games. Kind of like you see pitchers just throw the one pitch all game because they're just working on it, throw the guys there so they can hone those skills. And if you can see a progression in their skill set then move them or move them station to station. But, you know, I feel like if you're really trying to get the best out of them, it would just put them where they do the best, you know, and so, instead you're forcing an issue and it's, it's, it's like disrespectful to the game, like watching Angel Hernandez blow calls and it's, and it's easy to pick on him. You know, everybody, you know, Angel Hernandez is the worst, but he really, you watch him and he just calls bad games. Like it's even like not a funny joke anymore. Cause it's like, Jesus, like there he goes again, doing it. So I feel like it, it's almost like 
disrespectful to the game. Like, like it almost, it, it gives off the appearance that those umpires don't care. And I know they do. This is their profession. You know, they're not going to put their names out there and do this, but it gives the impression that either the MLB doesn't care about making sure things are done right, or the umpires don't either, either one of those is a bad look. I, I would agree. I would absolutely agree. And I mean, this ain't cheers. We don't want to know your name. If we, if we know the umpire's name, you know, they're a bad umpire. <laughs> Like, like an invisible umpire is the best umpire. One you've never heard his name is the best umpire because you don't have to hear about it. it exactly. Like the people from of recent years, I know Joe West is retired now, but Joe West is one of them that, especially in his la- latter part of his career, was was getting kind of shaky. Um, C.B. Buckner is another one that we know his name because he just is not spectacular. Um, and obviously we got Angel Hernandez, or probably the big three of recent year. Um, yeah. And it's just, I mean, you don't you, you don't want that. And imagine as a player, I know that we don't, we're not professionals or anything, but in our little dumb league that we play in, Sean and I, when you have a guy that's so inconsistent in the strike zone, you don't even play the game right because you're too worried about what you're, fi- you're fighting him instead of trying to focus on what pitches. You should know that you should always know that a ball inside is going to be a ball and it is not just going to randomly be called a strike. And now that, that changes your whole approach. Like, it's like, okay, well now what the heck I have to do this now when I should actually have to be, I don't know, whatever, swinging away. And now I have to be just protecting the plate. Like it, it, they shouldn't have to be controlling what the, now the batters have to do. And then based on their trash calls, like, yeah. So to the Joe West thing, I, I, he wasn't the most consistent, but I feel like the, one of the bigger problems with Joe West is it was about him quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, he would sometimes miss a call, but then it became personal. Like if you looked, you snorted, you scoffed, you did anything, then it was about Joe West. Then it was about, you're showing him up. You're not showing up. The umpire is showing up Joe West. And I feel like that was one of the more, more so than an inconsistent umpire. It was more so the Joe West show when he was out there right right and and one of the uh well you, you know usually when you hear umpires and you know their names you usually hear bad rap for them um and like in in one case like i mean i've seen many articles i've heard many uh analysts talk about it was uh former big league umpire john mcsherry people would often talk about how great of a guy he was how great of an umpire he was and if he made a mistake he'd own up to it um and you can say the same like for a guy like Jim Joyce, who made one of the worst calls in modern era history in Armando Galarraga's perfect game. But he was still a highly respected umpire. And the only reason most people know his name is because of that one call that happened to be that call. <laughs> and I mean, you could see he had a lot of emotion in his voice when he talked about it. He had a lot of emotion in his face when he met with Galarraga the next day. Um, he actually had some remorse for, for the kid and his uh, – and his potential great moment. So, and it still was a great moment. I mean, I mean, I, you, you haven't even heard, you hadn't heard his name much after that. And I think he just recently retired from professional baseball somewhere overseas. Um, but it's just, you have your, you have your umpires that are, that you know their name, but they're, they were still great guys. So, um, but yeah. All right. So I think that will wrap up our episode five of punts and bunts. Um, we'll see you guys later. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, follow us on all the socials, Instagram, uh, Twitter, right? We're, we're, we like to troll people on there. So, (laughs) all right. See ya. Later.